there's these deadly viruses that are not very transmissible. Mm -hmm. Ebola, rabies. And then there's these less deadly viruses that are very transmissible. Um, like uh, like COVID is, I guess, kind of borderline. But uh, why isn't there super transmissible, super deadly viruses? I think if you compare SARS-1 and 2, you get somewhat of an answer, right? SARS-1 was more deadly. In fact, over half of the time when people were infected, they ended up in the hospital because they were that sick. And then the peak of virus shedding from them happened long after they went in the hospital. So it's easy to contain uh, the infection when you're in a hospital, right? There was not much pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic shedding with SARS-1. And shedding means you you're inf you become infectious. So in, in a respiratory virus, you you inhale the droplets with the virus and they, they reproduce in your upper respiratory tract, what we call the nasopharynx, right? Mm -hmm. The nose and going back to that little cavity just above your, your mouth. So the virus reproduces really well. And then as you talk and sneeze and cough, you expel droplets and then those are inhaled by other people and then they reproduce. And for SARS-2, we now know there's a lot of reproduction just before you feel anything, if at mm -hmm. all. So there's a lot of shedding and transmission before you get symptomatic. And so, many people don't ever get symptomatic, right? So they right. spread really easily. So that explains why some viruses can transmit a lot better than others. And if one happens to knock you out, then you're never going to transmit because you're in the hospital like SARS-1. But why can't you have both? Why can't you just wait a while before it knocks you out, but when it knocks you out, it really kills you? That is that is a philosophical question, right? Because we could talk about why we haven't observed it. I mean, one one issue is that if, you, uh, if you're killed too quickly by a highly lethal virus, you're not going to transmit it very well, right? So Ebola can kill you quite rapidly, and most of the transmission occurs when people are being cared for at home or in hospitals. The doctors and nurses get the virus, but people walking around, you're not walking around when you have Ebola, you're too sick. You know, you have black, bloody diarrhea, you're vomiting, you're, you're ble bleeding from your skin and mucous membranes. You're not walking around, you're not going to parties. So I think that's part of it, that if the, if the infection is too lethal, you're simply not a good transmitter. And I think transmission is probably one of the most powerful selection forces for viruses because a virus always has to have find a new host. If it doesn't, it's a startup that fails, right? If it doesn't find a new host, it's gone. Yeah. And so anything that makes the virus transmit better is gonna help it. And if killing you, being less lethal is part of that, that works too. So there's a strong selection pressure against being lethal. I think there's a strong selection uh, pressure against being lethal and being more transmissible. Those two seem to work in opposite ways. And now we don't have a lot of data to support this. This is kind of a, a thought experiment, but there is one experiment done in Australia many years ago. I don't know if you know this, but in the 1800s, the hunters in Australia imported a rabbit from Europe so they could hunt it because the native rabbit in Australia was too fast for them. They couldn't shoot them. Mm -hmm. So they brought in this European rabbit and they they reproduced out of control. Within a couple of years, they were everywhere, millions of rabbits and all the watering holes. And now they had a problem. So they decided to use a virus to get rid of these excess rabbits. And they used a, a virus, a pox virus called myxoma virus, which is a natural virus of a different kind of rabbit. But for these European rabbits, it was quite lethal, and it spread by mosquitoes. So they said, "Okay, let's let's uh, release this virus." And in the first year, ninety nine point two percent of the rabbits were killed, but that point eight percent that were left had some form of resistance. They were variants. You know, every organism, not just viruses, makes mutants, and uh, there were some variants of the rabbits that could survive infection. And then in subsequent years. The virus became less lethal, and then the mosquitoes had a better shot of transmitting it from one rabbit to another if the rabbit lived longer. That's mm -hmm. the selection, probably. And so in the end, the, the rabbits lived on. The, the virus was there. It evolved to be more transmissible and less uh, 
lethal. So that's life the is only, amazing. That's life the only on data. Earth is amazing. It is. It is. If you take the time to look at it and see what's happened, it is amazing. It's also humbling that it just makes you realize humans are just a small part of the picture. Of course, and we're wrecking it, aren't we? <laughs> well, I mean, that's that. It's, we're not really. I mean, viruses are wrecking it some way. It's part of this. We're not really wrecking anything. It's all part of it. <laughs> but you know, when the ways that human exist encourages viruses to infect us, right? When we were hunter gatherers living in bands of a hundred people, very few viruses because it was hard for, for the virus to go from one band to another. And perhaps a hunter would, one of these humans would get an animal and bring a virus into camp and some people would die, but it would never spread mm -hmm. to another. And then when we started to congregate in cities, we figured out agriculture and so forth and how to harvest animals. Then we could get bigger and bigger populations and the viruses went crazy and they went from animals to us. So measles went from cows to humans when humans learned to domesticate cows and and uh, started gathering in big cities. Yeah, but now that humans are able to communicate and travel globally, the virus has become more and more dangerous, transmissible. Uh, thereby, if you look at Earth as an organism, thereby pushing humans to be more innovative, create alpha fold two and three and four and five, create better systems, and eventually there's rockets that keep flying from Earth, and eventually. Uh, the virus is becoming super dangerous and threatening all of human civilization will force it to become a multi-planetary species and this organism <laughs> starts expanding. So I think it's a feature, not a bug. I, I don't know. Um, well, I think that we have our early, probably the most of the, well, we're studying viruses since 1900, right? Most of that time was because of diseases they caused. The first viruses discovered, yellow fever, virus, smallpox, uh, polio virus, influenza virus, those were all because people got sick and they said, oh, look, this is a virus that's associated with it. And so we got good at learning how to take care of these infections, making vaccines and so forth over the years. And it's only in the last 20 years that we recognize that there are more viruses out there that are far more interesting, perhaps, but we've learned how to deal with the bad ones for sure.